Saint that we have chosen to speak about is a small little statue here of her. Her name is Maria Goretti, a young girl who died at the age of 11. As you can see, the statue depicts her as a young girl. That's how old she was when she died, she was 11, and you see it in this image here. You notice that she has, in her right hand, she has a green palm, and she has beautiful lilies. These are symbols to show her life, more or less, of what she was in the church. She was both a martyr, whenever you see a palm in the hand of a saint, a statue, you know that that's a martyr, the palm of victory. And also the lilies, as you know, white lilies, they represent purity, chastity, holiness of body. Well, that's also the virtue that she died for. She's a hero of the virtue of purity. She was born a long time ago, 1890, in a town on the west side of Italy near the Adriatic Sea called Corinaldo. And they were, she was born into a poor family. In central Italy at this particular time, there was turmoil going on in the country too in Italy. And just had happened just years before she was born. They had the reunion of all of Italy into one country. And there was political and also ecclesiastical turmoil. She's born into a poor family. Her mother was just an ordinary woman, housewife, mother of seven children. She was one of seven children. Her father was a farmer, and he was a, not a farmer that owned a piece of land. He had to work for other people. He worked for landowners, and so he was that type of a worker. If anything went wrong, he would be dismissed right away. Uh, there was no mercy. You can't do the job, we'll get somebody else. They were at, at itinerant farmers making money that way. Her father was burnt out, hard, hard life for him. Not that much money, not that, not that many conveniences in life. And so because of the way he was living and because he was, uh, he was a hard working man, he was burnt out and he got malaria. They lived in an area where there was lots of malaria because in the area that they lived, there was a lot of marshes, a lot of still water and mosquitoes used to breed in these areas. They got the malaria, and in those days there was no hope he died. She was just nine years old when her father died, and the mother was desperate. What do you do with seven children, and you're all alone as a widow? She got her daughter to understand, and she really did, of course, that she was an important part of the family that she had to take care of things that the mother had to work now to support the family. She had to take care of the children, the cooking, the cleaning, and the shopping. She took care of the family. She was a dutiful girl, but also a very religious girl too, pious, and a very good person. They lived in a building where two farming families lived. And on the other side, there was a family that had a young man, a young son, that worked on the farm too. He had an eye for her. She didn't know this was going on, but she began to suspect that he wanted something from her. And we know what that is, he wanted. He wants to have relations with her. He wants to touch her and all that. And she refused. She pushed him away each time. One day, he found a perfect opportunity to trap her in the house alone, where there'd be nobody around. Even if she screamed or yelled, they wouldn't know what was going on in the farmhouse. He pretended that he was sick one day, and he didn't go to work. He stayed home in the other apartment. He knew the girl, Maria, was downstairs preparing something to eat for the family, and sure enough, this was my opportunity. That's what makes the crime so terrible. It was like a first degree thing because he prepared it completely. What happened was that he went into the room, which is the kitchen area, 
where she was, and she was rather frightened. She was stunned because he never did this before. He approached her and tried to get her, grab her, and to touch her and feel her. She says, no, she said, don't do this. God doesn't want this. This is wrong. He didn't take that for a no. He tried to force her to have sex with him, and she refused to do it. Now he picked up a dagger, and she, was, she knew her life was at stake. Either she was going to give in and quiet him down and just do it, or resist him and take the dagger. And he plunged the dagger into her body. I think it was 14 times. 14 times he stabbed her. But it, wasn't, it was just surface cuts. Didn't go way in. So she survived it. And one of the women in the house heard a commotion and she ran downstairs to find Maria bleeding on the floor. They called the family, they called the workers to help. They got her to a hospital in Netuno. Netuno was not far away from Corinaldo. They got her to the hospital. She survived a number of hours and then she expired from the stab wounds. When they apprehended Alessandro, that was her, the boy's name, Alessandro, he denied it. He said, I never touched her. Or if she imagined this, she made this up, she framed me. Uh, he threw the whole evil on her. People do that sometimes to escape from the punishment that's coming. He didn't take it bravely. And he accused her and accused her and accused her until finally, finally, he told the truth. She's a good girl. She did not want to do anything with me, and I was enraged and I stabbed her. Her mother was still alive, of course, the father was dead. He, she was there at the hospital, and her last words to her mother were, th were these. Now listen to this important, huh? She forgave Alessandro for attacking her. She forgave him. Now you imagine that? Instead of screaming out that he did this and did that, everybody knew he did it, but he denied it. She forgave him. The mother eventually came to forgive him in time. What happened after this was that he was apprehended, brought to court, tried, and he was given 30 years of, of a prison. The prison was far away from Netuno, from Corinaldo and Netuno. He was taken to Naples. He was in solitary confinement for a number of years, at which time he finally de declared that this girl was innocent, she was a good girl, she never gave in to me, she knew I was coming after her with this dagger, and she resisted it. She would not give in to me. So what can we learn from something like this? Well, we learn from the saints how important certain virtues are. There was one priest saint who was Polish. He heard the confession of a person that other people wanted to find out what she said, and he wouldn't give in. All you have to do is tell us what she said in the confession. He wouldn't do it, and they cruelly beat him to death. He took it for the sack, for the secrecy of the confessional. These things are important for people to understand. There are sacred things that ought to be kept solid, not to be not to be changed. And one of them for this girl was her purity, her chastity, her cleanness of body, her cleanness of heart, cleanness of mind. As time went on in this prison sentence, he was still very bitter and angry, but he finally changed his mind. And that when he got out after 27 years on good behavior, instead of 30, he got 27 years that he did he went to a Capuchin Franciscan monastery and asked him if he could come in, and they allowed him in, and he became a rather saintly person. In the meantime, her devotion was spreading. Her body was practically incorrupt. They kept her in a beautiful case, glass case in the church because she was considered just a saintly person. But of course, her beatification already had taken place, her veneration, and now her canonization in 1950 was the biggest celebration in Rome. 
the biggest celebration ever in Rome for canonization in 1950 was the biggest attendance ever. People came from all over the world. Over a half a million people came in a time where there was hard transportation and not too much money going around. 1950 was the end of the Second World War. My brothers and sisters, there's something here for us to learn. That in our day and age, purity and chastity and holiness of body, holiness of mind and heart is not very popular. The world is telling us now, education and so forth, that we are animals. We're higher animals, but that's all we are, animals. And that's not right. We do have a soul. There's another part of us that's very important, and she brings out just one phase of it that needs to be important again today. Chastity, virginity, purity, holiness of body, holiness of mind, holiness of heart. So she is the patroness of youth. The church has made the patroness of youth to look to her instead of to look to others who glamorize the body, who make the body everything. Purity is out the window today, practically, when it comes to the youth. It's not their fault entirely. This is what the world is presenting them with. She had a different world. And so with her world, we need to enter more into it to honor the virtues of life, all of them. And in her case, it was the virtue of purity. St. Maria Goretti, in an age where purity is not that important anymore, in fact, it's glamorized, it's glorified, and it's exposed right to the world as something beautiful. You teach us that purity, although chastity and purity are wonderful things, that marriage is also a beautiful thing. Sex is a beautiful thing in its right place. Where sex is, and God is, we have a beautiful situation, like good, good marriages. Inspire our young people today to fight for chastity, to fight for purity, to fight for cleanliness of mind and heart and body, because that is so important for the family, for society, that these things be practiced and learned at a young age. St. Maria Goretti, pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.